Has anybody ever been there? You're out skiing, halfway down the slope, and you turn around to watch someone take that steep part. And as you turn, you temporarily forget that your feet are strapped to waxed boards, specifically designed to speedily slide down slippery slopes. But you don't forget for long. As you finish turning around to see your friend rocking some serious downhill style, you suddenly recall what are attached to your feet as you begin to feel them sliding backwards. First slowly, then faster, 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 until you're completely out of control, flying backwards down the sketchiest parts of the ski run. Your friends, of course, think you're doing this on purpose and that you're just showing off your incredible skiing skills. And you know this, so you try not to show a look of complete panic on your face. You play it cool. Uh, cool kids don't need to see where they're going, do they? Now, of course, nobody can sustain that kind of madness for too long and you're no exception. And so you begin to wonder how to stop or at least get turned around. And something happens. Your skis begin to wobble. And the next thing you know, you're practicing your cartwheels slope style. Whew. Well, that didn't work. You think to yourself, I guess I was pointed in the wrong direction. Have you ever been there? Because I sure haven't. Nothing to see there. <laughs> I don't ask my friends. By the end of his life, King David had come to realize one important thing. You need to point your life in the right direction. Now this became a mission of his as he began to prepare his son Solomon to take the throne after him. And as he looked forward, through his son, he had time to look backwards on his own life too. And when he did that, David could see God working all the way. As he looked back, David could see all the way back to the story of his great-grandmother Ruth. She was a foreigner from the country of Moab who married an Israelite who was escaping a bad famine. Now the Israelite died and his mother Naomi decided to come back home and Ruth wanted to come with her. Ruth refused to let Naomi convince her to stay behind, saying, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Wow. Talk about a heritage of faith. See, Ruth was forsaking everything she knew to become a stranger in another country. She left behind her family, her culture, her religion, her friends, her everything. And why? Because she saw something in Naomi and her son. And she wanted it for herself. Now, Ruth eventually remarried, had a son named Obed, who became David's grandfather. And so long before he was ever born, David was already being pointed in the right direction by his great-grandma. Now, I can imagine David, old, white hair, sitting on a chair looking out his window at the beautiful city of Jerusalem, all spread out around him and thinking about his life gone by. Perhaps next, he thought back to his time as a shepherd boy, building character, laying the groundwork for parts that, of his life that he could not have even imagined at the time. And it was during his time as a shepherd that David learned the importance of taking care of even the weakest lamb. He learned how to read the land and the weather. He learned the habits of wild animals and how to fight them if necessary. He learned to lead and to gather sheep, and to care for their wounds. And maybe it was out with the sheep that he learned to play, with his, to play his harp. Perhaps it was out with the sheep that David began to write music and to pour out his heart to God through the meter of his poetry. And it was out with his sheep that David learned to use his first weapon, a sling, capable of firing a fist-sized rock incredibly long distances with insane accuracy. 
Little side note about slinging stones, archaeologists have actually found examples of lead slinging stones from Greece dating back to around 400 BC and inscribed on the side of the stone is the Greek word dexal, which has two meanings in ancient Greek. Take that and catch. Trash talking, it turns out, is nothing new. Regardless of that, David learned how to sling like a pro and while well, out with his sheep, David also learned to trust his life to God. As David looked back on his life as a shepherd, he no doubt realized that God had been preparing him with skills that would translate to a much bigger theater. Now, instead of taking care of sheep, one day, David would be taking care of a band of 600 people living off in the forest in the wilderness, hiding out from an angry king. And one day he would be the king with an entire nation to take care of. And he would no doubt find those skills coming in handy in ways that he'd never have imagined. God was without a doubt pointing David in the right direction. Now, David must have marveled as he thought back to how God had protected him again and again before he even fought Goliath. He had somehow made a name for himself as a pretty good musician. And so when King Saul was in his dark, depressive moods that he often got into, Saul would sometimes have an attendance go and, and get a musician to come and play for him, to lift up his spirits. And often that musician was David. Apparently David's form of harp jazz was just what Saul needed because David was asked to return again and again. And even after the whole Goliath thing, when David was married to Princess Michael, he would still come and play for King Saul to help him clear his head. But twice, as he did this, Saul would remember his jealousy, grab his spear, and hurl it at David. Um, now, for those of you who are musicians, you probably know that a lot of times, especially if you're playing mood music, it's easy to get lost in it all. You get so carried away with those jams that you don't really notice anything else happening around you. And so, the fact that David didn't die either of those times was actually a miracle. I mean, not only did Saul, a warrior king miss two sneak attacks from close range, but somehow David was paying enough attention that the Bible says he eluded Saul twice. No doubt, God had been with David all his days, and, and David recognized that. And because of these events that some might call good luck or pure chance, David learned to trust and to lean more and more on God as he continued to point himself in the right direction. As old King David turned from his window and looked around his room, he began to think of his wives. Yes, his wives. In those days, apparently it was cool to marry more than one lady. And so in addition to Princess Michael and Bathsheba, he also married Ahinoam and Abigail. Uh, now David was a pretty emotional guy and he had loved them all. But as he looked around his room, perhaps his mind went back to Abigail and how they'd met. It was back when David was still on the run. His spiritual mentor, the prophet Samuel, had just died. And David and his men had moved to the desert of Maon. And while they were there, they put themselves to work protecting the servants of the richest guy in the area, a stingy, stubborn, cranky old guy named Nabal. Now, Nabal hadn't hired them. But they thought that Nabal, being a wealthy guy, would make a good ally since he could help feed them fund their mini mercenary army and, and so they protected his servants in an effort to build goodwill. Now, of course, Nabal thought that any idea involving him sharing his wealth was a bad idea. And when asked about it, he sent David's men away empty-handed. Now, David, still hurting from Samuel's death, he took offense to Nabal's stinginess and he led about 400 of his men back to Nabal's ranch so they could put him in his place. And here's where David and Abigail's story began. Abigail was wise. Although she was the wife of Nabal, she knew that he was a fool and that he never should have turned David's men away. And so she secretly ordered their servants to load up the donkeys with huge gifts of food and wine. And she took all of these on the path toward where she knew David's camp was. When she met David and his men, hangry and coming for a raid, she got off her donkey, bowed to David, and begged him to ignore her husband. His name meant fool, and that's exactly what he was. 
Abigail told David that God had prevented him from shedding blood and that all of this food was a gift. David realized what he was about to do and he praised God for Abigail and her wisdom and he made peace with her and her whole household. When Abigail got home, Nabal was crazy drunk and so she didn't tell him a thing until morning. The next day when he'd sobered up, she told him what had happened and whether it was from his foolish living or just that his selfish little heart had failed him, when Nabal heard what had happened, the Bible says his heart failed him and he passed out. Ten days later, he died. And although it's kind of a weird way to begin a love story, Abigail in her wisdom saved David from a horrible mistake. She stopped him. She got his attention, made him listen, and turned him back around in the right direction. David decided a woman like that was a woman he needed to marry, and so he did. Now, David had many other experiences in his life, and sometimes he turned himself the wrong way, but God would always send somebody or something to make sure that he was headed in the right direction, and most of the time, David paid attention. And as he neared the end of his life, he wanted more than anything to make sure that his son Solomon uh, would himself be pointing in the right direction as he prepared to take the throne. Because as David said in his last words, when one rules over men in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of the morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings the grass from the earth. In other words, when you're good to people and when you live like someone who knows God, you make people feel safe and hopeful. Your life is refreshing and it's good for everyone. But he said, evil men are to be cast aside like thorns which are not gathered with the hand. Whoever touches thorns uses a tool or the shaft of his spear. Uh, they're burned up where they lie. Those apparently were David's last words, but what he was saying was that if you live selfishly, if you react negatively or make bad choices, not only are you useless, but the world will reject you and nobody will want you and they may even try to get rid of you. Little wonder then that David wanted to make sure his son was facing the right direction and he did a pretty good job too. King Solomon continued to rule well. Under his reign, Israel kept growing and continued living peacefully. His reputation and influence spread far and wide, and people came from all over to learn from this man who had asked God wisdom to rule worthily. And when all was said and done for Solomon, he wrote a book looking back on his life. It's called Ecclesiastes, and it's essentially a letter to young people. And in it, Saul talks about different things he'd done, the adventures he'd had, the things he'd learned, the challenges he'd faced, the things he'd accomplished. And he tells us how in the end, each one of them were meaningless, pointless. This was a guy who did everything. He had everything, but it all meant nothing. Now, Ecclesiastes can be a pretty depressing book if you miss the very end, because at the end, King Solomon, the man who tried everything, reveals the only thing he ever found to have any meaning. He said, now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commands, uh, for such is the duty of man. And in the end, despite some massive misadventures, Solomon too was pointed in the right direction. Now, the question I have today is this. Which way are you pointed? It's not a trick question. It's probably easy for you to tell. Are you going the right direction? Or are you pointed down a route with some obstacles in the way? If you've never thought about it, you should. It's good to stop every now and then and to figure out which way you're facing. Because even if you're far down the wrong path, it's never too late to turn, point yourself in the right direction with God's help. Keep moving forward. Now maybe God gave you someone in your past, like David's great grandma Ruth, to help provide you with a legacy of faith. Maybe God's using your circumstances right now to prepare you for something amazing he has planned in the future. I mean, maybe you think you're just a boring old sheep herder, but who knows? Maybe you're a king in training. Maybe God has rescued you from danger and it's made you stop and think about life in a way you've never seen it before. Or maybe God's given you an Abigail, a person in your life who will stop you in your tracks and wisely and kindly point you back in the right direction. Where you're going matters. And God's not going to leave that to chance. He takes an active interest in your life and where you're going. And he'll proudly stand with you if you let him saying, this is my son. This is my daughter. I love her. I'm so proud of him. Mm -hmm.